putting the human back into technology with Gethin Ellis and Mark Williams. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Fit Podcast. Here at GethinEllis.com, whilst we know physical fitness is essential, our mental health is vital too, and our Fit Podcast is all about putting the human back into technology. One thing we can probably all agree on is the last year or so has been unprecedented. So we wanted to seek out the views of technology leaders, business owners, consultants and many others from a range of different businesses and organisations to discuss with them the impacts on their business, on their people and on their technology and how they see the future unfolding. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to episode 9 where we speak to David Richards. So welcome everybody to the uh, ninth episode of Putting the Human Back into Technology podcast. This week, Mark and I are joined by our special guest, David Richards, whose company is called Talk About Value. You can probably see it in the background there, but welcome, David. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me, Gethin. Good to see you, pal. Do, do, we need to tell, do we need to tell our guests, our, our, our audience, Mark, that you and... Uh, you we have history, is the way we're saying it. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the right thing. <laughs> yeah, so, long uh, history. It's history, isn't it? 1991, I think, isn't it, Mark? Oh, I was, I, 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 I was just about to start uh, high school in 1991. Oh, shut up! Uh, anyway, I digress. Um, David, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mark and I tend to alternate the questions, and as our regular listeners will know, that uh, we sometimes get muddled up and uh, we go off on some tangents. But we'll do try to sort of keep to the theme. But the first question is a nice, easy one. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, what your job is, what your business is. Okay. So about three years ago, I set up my own um, consultancy and it focuses on the area of value. Okay. Uh, you know, the hint is in the, the name of the, the company. It's about helping corporates mainly to understand yeah. how they can, in effect, sell on using their value rather than on price, in gotcha. a nutshell. Right. Um, so rather than getting into discounting models or trying to price lower than the competition, it's about understanding what you can do better and then being able to communicate that to your customers in a way that they understand and actually they they can really use. Because fundamentally, if you look at the way that businesses work, um, and I guess the stuff that we do as individuals is we the objective of what we're trying to do is to make the company we're working for more effective or more efficient than they were before they engaged with us. Yeah. The benefit of that is we get a salary out of it and we can charge what we want. But fundamentally, if we can't demonstrate that their business will be better in some way in the future because of using our services, um, they won't want to place their businesses with us or they'll knock us down on price because they can't see why they should pay you money in the first place. So my business is about working with companies to understand what they think they're doing. They're typically companies that are saying, you know, I can't grow in a particular area or I'm not specialized enough in an area or I don't know how to communicate that. Yeah. And then I help them really clarify how they can charge what they're worth so they can increase the, if you like, the customer's willingness to pay for their services above what they're currently doing. So if they decided, for example, that they wanted to increase their prices, rather than just sending out a note to say, right, I'm putting all my prices up by 10%, they could put some justification behind that to explain why that is a no-brainer as opposed to the client and make it a positive thing rather than the client thinking, oh, the prices have gone up and I don't yeah. understand why. Yeah. You should probably you should probably talk to Barclays. I'm sure Mark would uh, have a few things to uh, <laughs> yeah. a few things well, to say about Barclays. But, well, but, I've had a right moment about them in the last couple of days about my, my business. It, 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 it's, 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 it's interesting concept that the, the sort of value thing because it is it is quite an important deal because you, if you're competing on price generally, you're probably on the race to the bottom. You, you, you are. You, 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 you're not going to survive too long. You're not going to you're not going to get any any worth from your work. Um, no, and absolutely right. And and. I'm not saying it's not a pro it's not a strategy. You can have a strategy, but it's got to be done in a particular way. And you've got to realise that if you start to lower prices or discount heavily, then the likelihood is that in some medium term position, that model will be unsustainable. However, if you start like with uh, with us guys, I don't know if you found this at the start, but we generally underprice ourselves as we learn what value we offer our customers and then after a period of a year we look around at the figures and say oh this doesn't really stack up yeah, i need yeah. to increase my prices and and rather than um just do it randomly 
the process is that you can justify that. Mm -hmm. So you can say to a say to a client, you know, here are the outcomes I expect. This is what I can do to help you deliver them. I'm charging this rate, and if you work it all out, then actually I'm very I'm very inexpensive. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's that benefit cost rate, you know. Yeah. I, I, equation. When, when we, um, I mean, obviously we've communicated on and off over the years, David, you and I haven't we? we, we about, usually about rugby or or, or or kids or whatever. But um, um, I genuinely, when um, we, we started getting back in touch more on on the business front, which was probably not that long after you set up again, you know, three years ago. I didn't realise it was three years ago actually. Yeah. Um, but but uh, I, I was genuinely interested. In, okay, so how, how do you go about doing what you do? So I want to. I'm going to ask the second question. Um, but I'm going to sort of paraphrase it a little bit. I, I, I'm sitting here. Then I'm the great uneducated in this, you know, in, in, in this in this topic area, um, perhaps. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, so somebody would have would have um, got David in because they they just know that they need to do this better and they need to they need to sell on value, not on price, and so on and so forth. Then you'll go into a room of people and there'll be a bunch of people sitting here, salesmen probably. Uh, marketeers sitting in there and, and they'll be wanting to present to you as soon as they possibly can rather than listen just to yeah, know, yeah. throw in a different you know different angle on this so I imagine that that you know because I know you and through and through the way the way you are the way your personality is and you know and, and, and how much gravitas you've got but you that historically you would have been able to go into a room sit people down and you know, have a good old chat with them if you like and I don't mean that in a loose way but a good good proper chat with them and, and Bob's your uncle you know you, you know you'll have um you'll have a gig for however long that that gig lasts so yep. in the context of the last year or so whether that whether what I've said is right or wrong I'm genuinely interested in how you go about doing your business and I think you know a lot of our listeners will be and and, and if and how that's changed and how it's imp been impacted over the last 15 months or so it has um most of my work is through word of mouth frankly um it's 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 building on relationships i have and then sharing new insights so the clients i have are people i are mainly people i've worked with before um because they know what i'm capable of but also through networking and you know i'm a pretty heavy linkedin user if i'm absolutely honest um it's <laughs> I must admit, it's getting hard with LinkedIn to stand out a bit more because there is so much going on. And if you, you know, if you build a community of what typically, I don't know, 1300, which isn't big yeah. in LinkedIn terms, but it's bigger than most, <clears throat> you know, it's it's hard to, to find those really useful um, insights um, from the, 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 the a lot of what I consider to be sort of uh, um, commentary that's going on. Um, so what I've tried to do is really sort of work and focus on individuals and get into dialogues with them, and that produces work. Um, I mean, I guess I'm in a, in a in a lucky position for a new, relatively new business, is that I've got one client who I work pretty heavily with who pays the bills, right? And then the other stuff I do is stuff that I enjoy doing. So I can be a bit choosier than I perhaps I would have been. Uh, you know, if I had to start with a blank sheet of paper, but your 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 question is well made, Mark, because uh, you know when you start and you become your own business, um, you've got, you've got to create your own reputation, authority in the market. It may be slightly different from what you've been doing, which is true for me. Um, and therefore, the only way I think you can do that is to, in a, in a way, get out there, show your face. As somebody said to me, this you know, running a business isn't a isn't a sprint it's a marathon so and if you're doing a marathon you need to get the miles in so even in the early days it was about going out and testing propositions talking to people networking and the biggest challenge is you you asked over the last years physically couldn't do that yeah um so that that hard hardcore networking i was doing probably 18 months ago i wouldn't say i was going to the opening in an envelope but i was being not i wasn't particularly that was a question I was going to ask, David. Is, is in terms of your networking, where would you go to do that? What would what would be your approach and strategy? Well, my view is to try try everything and see which works for you. Um, there are all sorts of networking um, organisations. In fact, there is money in networking per se. Um, that's what I've realised is that there are a lot of people who are building networking organisations charging monthly fees or in you know individual fees um there are so many to join and 
frankly, some some are talking to your your own peers, but actually, you want to be talking to people who can um, introduce you into other companies or um, find you other opportunities. So, I, you know, as I said, I, I, I won't I won't um, dis- hide the fact that I went out and talked to lots and lots of people to start with, and then over a period of time. I found out those that ones that seemed to work and those that didn't, and therefore I put more effort into those. Um, and that's the way to do it. And there are um, some networking organisations that you might not even feel comfortable with. And I don't know if you you know you know the ones that I'm talking about, but they're uh, they're pretty you know um, culty. Well, it feels a bit. That's the word probably I'd use. It's it, and it's a huge commitment. You know, every yeah. week at the same time. Um, and if if that's your bag, then great. Um, just wasn't for me. Uh, well, uh, much like you, I've, I've, we've been exploring the sort of networking um, and and how to best approach it. So it's always nice just to chat about that. But it wasn't for me either. In truth, it's like it's, I'm, I'm not going to be able to commit to it. So, um, and I'm not sure how much value I'm going to get for it. But I know others that seem to do. I know people who built significant businesses on the back of that because they're yeah. in a sweet. They've found themselves in a particular group. Yeah. They've got a particular proposition that resonates with that group, yeah. and um, and it's working really well. Behind the scenes, they would tell me that they don't enjoy doing it, but they'll do it because it generates the business. The business so it's yeah. worth it's worth their two hours a week on a Friday, whatever it is, to go and do that. I, I, I won't do it. I don't feel I need to do that. Um, but I, it's an important thing to go and see because it might work for you, and if it is, it could be a very good source of business in the future. So my view on networking is try everything. I've even been on a networking walk. There's a business okay. in Oxfordshire that is now doing walks around the countryside where you network with five or six people. And you sometimes find one person that really can. I found one person I really connected with and that's really helped. So yeah. as Mark will know, everything in marketing, you never quite know what's going to land. <laughs> mm. But if you, you know, if you, if you do enough, if you do enough at the start, um, you can quickly tell what works for you. And I would suggest then you you do more of that rather than force yourself to go to things you're not comfortable with. Okay, cool. I, I so much want to ask other questions. No, now. Mark, ask other questions because that's technically question <laughs> three there. So, so ask some questions. Go on, Mark. It's your turn next. I, I, I think we're, just, we're talking about the networking stuff and, and the – the pitch up somewhere and do five minutes on yourself and you know and you know the speed dating type things they're not for me because i can't possibly describe anything in five minutes so i've got to take at least five hours and everybody who was working there with me know, knows that i can't shut up when i you know when i, when I get the stage so that's I'll true and shut up. that's true yeah um but you know it, it is it is interesting, isn't it, that, that, um, that you know, it, it, it's, it's going back to, you know, the talk about uh, about those that want to buy from you and those who are in the you know, buying and selling cycles being aligned yeah. and those that, 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 that do align with your um, with your philosophy and so on and so forth. And, you know, in your case, buying on value. And, and you know, we've got some stuff through, through others that we're trying to help people with yeah. with, with the technology, not, not just put the bloody technology in. Um, and um it, you've got to, it, it's working out how you sieve the wheat from the chaff i think you know in in, in that because um as you say you, you know you've got to sometimes you've got to kiss, kiss a lot of frogs to um you know to get get to the one that that, the print, that, yeah. that, 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 that that you want so i mean thinking about i probably asked that second question but i'm gonna ask the third one anyway so thinking about you know your clients and so on and so forth that you're that you're working with yeah um how how do you how do they fit? How do they, how do people fit in in into that um, that sort of model for you know for, for you? And, and how do you feel like um, you know your clients have, have been um, either supporting you perhaps um, you know through working with them or, or, or indeed supporting their own people over the last fifteen or well I want to say fifteen months but it's probably longer now sixteen or seventeen months maybe. Yeah. But yeah, pe- people and, and how do they fit into into probably your your, your clients' world, I guess, more so because you're you're like a so you know relatively small business. Yeah, I think, and I think this my answer has changed over time on this, so that might be interesting. So in the early days, I thought um, as long as I could have a good logical argument as to the benefits of using me, either in terms of increased sales or whatever, that that would that would really take off and whatever. What I actually found was. I'm more successful when somebody has a defined problem and yeah. they've got an issue. So it's I've realized it's much easier to solve a problem than it is to promise a future benefit. 
so if you've if you've got if you've got a um you know you've got a system for example let's talk it in in your guys language if you've got a system that's uh not working properly it's um it's i think it's personally much easier to sell a fix to that problem to solve that specific issue than potentially to go in and say rip that all out because i'll i can give you 50 percent more productivity if you choose this new system yeah. because people think i've got a problem it's defined i know what i'm paying for um if you can solve that problem i can sort of put a value to that and therefore you can move on if you're promising something of the future it's like most of the things we buy do we believe that we'll get that i mean the reality is do it does anybody ever measure that anyway i mean i've been in big corporates where we've had to uh, um you know put together all these cases for a new it system uh you know down to you know figures on improvements or growth or visitors or all that sort of stuff been hauled over the coals in terms of the uh, finances told to tweak a couple of things and given the the stamp of approval does any everybody come up two years later and said so how was it never happened to me in my whole career it's like we do all this analysis in order to move forward and then we don't even follow up to learn the lessons learned and i think drives that me, drives that, me potty david it really does the whole benefit you know the outcome realization piece the the, the problem with uh, here we go this will probably turn everybody off from every future podcast that we do now the problem with today's executive is that they're far too quick to move on to the next thing in in my view you know what they, if they're going to do something let's say it's a good idea along the lines of what you're just talking about and any any of those sorts of things fine you're doing it because you think it's the right thing at that point in time. Yep. Takes you two years to deliver it or, or whatever. Make the bloody most of it. Now, if you deliver the wrong thing, fine. Learn from it, you know, yep. and, and, and get over it. If you deliver the right thing, don't turn your attention to something else that then just um, substitutes all the bloody good work that you've um, yep. detracts from all the good work you just put into the thing you wanted to deliver in the first place. Drives me absolutely potty. I, and I think, that, I, I think there's also a human angle playing there, Mark, which I've seen many times, is that sort of when you've got the sign off to do the project quite a lot of people just switch off and look for the next shiny thing to look at yeah, yeah. so you know you don't have that continuity and even the managers i mean you know in sales your year ends on the sales year end doesn't it if it's 31st yeah. of december january the first doesn't actually exist does it because you're being measured on that year and if if you're if you've got a manager who's been managing on that year a project that's going to take two years to deliver is irrelevant in a way because who knows whether they'll be in there to manage it in the first place yeah. so i think you need you know leadership rather than management if you like leadership to understand that bigger issue which is why i think many ceos should spend their time looking at it systems and i'm surprised how few do because actually if you look at the resources being piled into it these these days I don't know the exact figures, but I would assume it was uh, probably the second most e expensive cost they've got in their business after people. I don't know, but I would think that it it's probably, probably is, there. It, it, it probably is. It probably yeah. is. I'm, 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 just, but, I'm making an assumption there. I don't, I don't know the answer yeah, to that. But, but. but there's a well, lot of... The top like are usually people, buildings, and technology. Yeah, not, there's not a lot of money going much. into IT. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but my, my, my question there is... Uh, so, so what my experience of this is sometimes someone has a good idea let's do a system fantastic all right brilliant um and then okay they get signed off and they're going to do it it then goes from being a business problem to an it problem and that's yeah. where the that's where the fall down um or seems to happen because then oh, so it's got to take care of that now we've given given it to them to do as it as opposed to it being driven or being but business, it's the business. This yes is exactly, exactly. Understand. you know where does the ownership lies it's sort of as you say it gets past the back and gets past to the pointy heads, if you like, mm. who go away and build something and then in, you know, six months come back and say, you know, here's what we built. And, you know, that's where Agile has come from, isn't it, in terms yeah. of learning that, making that fast. But I think the fundamental issue, and I've, I have saw this um, before, is that, you know, even when you're trying to build a new system, the people using the system don't understand necessarily how it works or behind the scenes or how they could improve it improve it so you know i've seen an example where you know a brand new system coming in let's go and talk to the users to do the user journey because that's the good thought let's create all these avatars in terms of customers and their journey through for example a website or or that sort of stuff and um 
you go and talk to the people who are actually doing the job today and you ask them, well, how can this improve? And they don't even understand your question. I think it's, you know, that you, you need to make sure that you can have that conversation. I think the same is true with CEOs. I don't think they ask the right questions because they don't know enough about it. Does, I does think that, does that come but, down to a little bit of culture as well? I think it think? comes down to culture and I think it comes down to generations as well. Mm. I think now there are CEOs who are coming through in their 40s and 50s of big organisations who do understand IT because they've been through it. They've been through the dot-com. They understand the web. They've their whole lives with smartphones. They get it. Perhaps some of the older CEOs, um, you know, I was, I think I was the first year to do my O-level with a calculator as opposed to a slide rule. God, it shows how old I am, but it just, you know, tech, tech is, I, you know, I didn't get my first, um, uh, you know, uh, PC or it wasn't a PC, but a desktop screen uh, until 1986. So I had seven, eight years years of business work without even a computer. Now that's an impossible thought. So I came through a generation. Mark, you may be the same. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I, Mark, I've got a photo of Mark. Where it you is, like that, did you? You like that? And you like, like that little dig? Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think, you know. Who I can remember a CEO telling me that he never read emails because he got his PA to to, yeah. to print them off. Yeah. They had no interest in it, and yet they were sinking. And I think they were frightened of understanding it because it is a different world. Yeah. I think the people who work in IT um, have particular skills, and that doesn't necessarily match up with people who do business. Mm. And I think there's a trans there's a sort of translation requirement in the middle to, you know, to to make those two things work together um and i think that's that's really interesting because i think it's like two tribes but they can't talk they go to war to quote a phrase yeah. you know they they um they they and, and the blame kicks in because you know i thought you were going to do this yeah i'll build that for you but you haven't you know i've built it in this way oh well it doesn't do what i want oh yes it does if you do it using this i think i think to be honest with the amount of money that's being involved you know C CS CEOs need to understand that far more. Yeah, I I I, I tend to agree. What you were describing there sounded like a Dilbert cartoon. I don't know if you've ever seen seen those where the techies talking to the manager as if they're speaking different languages. The yeah. manager comes in. I think we need a SQL database, and Dilbert goes back. What color would you like it in? And he says mauve. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just it's just it is it is it, you, you kind of and it's nobody's fault. Head. This is no, the thing. It's, I think it's there's not, always it's not, there's no. always a degree of there's somebody's fault. You know, IT didn't hear me, or I didn't, or the IT more saying, well, the user doesn't know what they want, which is probably more nearer the truth. Um, it, it's nobody's fault, but the outcome means that you're going to have a system that's not going to satisfy anybody, yeah. and or or you're not building it in a way that you can you can get real value out of it in the future, which is where I come in, which is okay. Well, you're doing all this, so what is the outcome that you're looking for? Um, so I think there's there's the you know better communications required or a different type of communication actually, I mean, working uh, you know working with ITs and IT departments they work in a different way. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, they, they certainly can do. I, I I see that changing quite a lot as when I started out because I'm a techie by trade and by skills. Um, and when I started out, IT was very much a cost centre for the organisations that I worked in, as in, well, we need email, but as you said, the chief exec of the local authority was having his emails printed out so he could read them at his yep. desk and so on and so forth. But over the course of time, IT now delivers key business capabilities, whereas before they didn't see it as as, yep. as being the driver of that. Um, and there's definitely been a... Um, it's definitely been some shift in lots lots of the organizations I work with where they are seeing the the value the value that it yeah. that it can bring. Um, but there's still a long way to go as well. And I think it's very hard to show that value um to the people beforehand. There's a degree of a leap of faith, isn't there? Um, yes, you're right. It is. There, there, there is there is a degree of a leap of faith. But I guess the easy way to go, well, look, you're spending this anyway. Right. So you're going to spend that again next year. It's not you're not getting nothing on it on your ROI. What happens if you spend half a million more and you might make two? Yeah. Uh, you know. So, so, so uh, but anyway, uh, that's yeah. the, uh, well. Uh, I guess I was trying to lead into the next question, really. But um, we may have discussed it. How how do you use technology and 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 data, perhaps, to drive what you do for your uh, for your businesses, or do you use it? Do you look at, yeah. look at any any data to? 
Yeah, it's it's interesting actually because one of the areas that I I'm doing quite a lot of work in with my clients at the moment is um, related to my work at um, BAA, and that's about connected and autonomous vehicles and okay. also telematics. So um, the the big shifts that are ha- happening now is that um, in the uh, in you know a few years ago telematics was seen as a um you know the golden bullet that would solve problems in terms of particular driving behavior you know you, because you'd get information straight from the car as to what what actions they were taking what driving decisions they're taking and what suddenly became apparent is that people were very good at collecting the data but then it would get stuck somewhere and nobody would actually work out how to use it and i'm sure you've seen that in many situations mm-hmm. with with systems yeah we've got a great system but we can't get a report out to tell them tell you yeah. the most basic stuff What's happened is the whole concept of big data has has been realized because you can see so many industries and so many growing companies that are using data to drive their whole business. So what's happened is that's coming now, particularly into the telematics industry, where people are saying it's not enough just to collect it, is, well, how do we take this data, you know, transform it into information, then turn that into knowledge and then take that into insight and wisdom so you know going up that information tree of value yeah so rather than just collect it there's a lot of work going on bringing different sources of data together and and um in the business reporting world creating what is described as one version of the truth or one yeah. view of the information in one place so rather Your than having to data rather than having to pull five systems together and stick it in a spreadsheet and then do lots of calculations and then come up with a report, you've got a system that does that for you. So you can just click a button and you've got the information or you, or it displays just the exceptions to the rule rather than the whole information. So you can make easier decisions. So I see data and, and technology being used more and more in terms of related to a de- defined outcome or something that will benefit the company so i think that's happening um in terms of the broader things i think the biggest thing particularly in the last year has been this whole shift towards a more remote um workforce uh supply chain you know anything i think it's um it'll be interesting to see as the rules of covid come down hopefully in the next month or so whether we return to form or whether this is we're working in a new world because quite a few of the things that you know some of the trends were already happening before covid happened what seems to have happened is it's it's speeded a lot of those up you know there's anecdotally wasn't that story of somebody saying i was going to do a replacement it system in 24 months i've now done it in three weeks type of thing and saying you know and quite often change change is driven by adversity you know that's that's the truth of the matter um so it'll be interesting to see whether people return to form i th- i think i think companies have now realized that if if their channels to market or their supply chain or or ability to just communicate on a regular basis is um is compromised in some way then they need systems to support that i mean i don't know if you remember mark we used to have i remember doing a webex back in 1997 you know, and then suddenly this last couple of years, Zoom seems to be a new brand new thing. This technology has been around for 25 years, but because there's a need, there's a value in using it. And I think, yeah. and that will develop. I think, you know, we'll see Zoom for conferences. We'll see Zoom for networking. We'll see, you know, Zoom for podcasts. Yeah. You know, it, over a period of time, this technology yeah. will give us even more options. It's, it's interesting what you say with them. Um... With, with with the Zoom thing, comparing it to WebEx because it is old tech, but all that's changed with those is is the model. Whereas having WebEx in 1997, I bet was very very expensive, yeah. and they tried to maintain that same sort of pricing model. Whereas with Zoom, you come in, you pay a tenner a month, or you use it for free, yeah. and then they they serve ads. So it's just, it's just the model that's changed, which is which expedited Zoom over over the others who were already in the market, but with a with a different business model. That's my kind of take on it. And they, you know, they, they've got to, they're using some new tech in there as well. It's a lot sleeker than, you know, WebEx. It's, WebEx is fine now, but it used to be quite clunky from from um, from a user interface perspective. 
Yeah, there was a whole load of sign-on issues, I seem to remember, and downloading apps onto your PC and all sorts yeah. of things, from what I remember. Whereas Zoom, from what I can gather, is purely web, web, mm. web-based, web so you don't need all the stuff on your laptop. Um, I think there's also been a really good marketing campaign there as well, yeah. um, because it is now you do a Zoom call. It's a bit like I use a Hoover. Yeah. It is now the default name for a a video call isn't it whether you're using like we are today teams or whatever this could be classed as a zoom call so um well it's a lot easier to say than go to meeting and webex and things like that anyway isn't it so yeah but um, your heart goes boom david to get another (laughs) uh, listen i want to ask you something just before we go into the last couple of questions sure um, if i may it's kind of related to uh, um not so much the webex side of things but what we were just talking about a moment or two ago um um uh, telematics stuff, gathering data has been around for donkeys, right? The yep. utility companies and uh, rail track, I'm, I was working with them on their SCADA stuff. For, you know, yep. They've been gathering data about I don't know, sewage or <laughs> whether the track's going to break or whatever money for, for a hell of a long time. So I entirely agree with you that a lot of these things, um, like the web technology we were just talking about, you know, have been around for a while and then something happens and it changes the, you know, it changes the dynamic and, and it becomes more important. Um, so I don't know whether this is you know relating to your clients or, or perhaps relating to, to what you do in in in, in the value uh, talk about the value yeah. um, concept. But how much I think think about what we're talking about with the chief execs earlier. How much data is enough? So when have you got enough in order to make that decision? Because the example with the business case here is really good because you gather a shed load of data, and at that point in time you make a decision about it. Yeah. But of course, what you want to do really is gather data on an ongoing basis and find a way of making decisions that, uh, you know, make you collect things better or, you, or, or, or monitor things better or improve the service and so on and so forth. So how, how do you get that? And think about, you know, what you do, you, you, you go in, you, you shine the light on value and they go, oh, yeah, we need to be doing that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then, it, then it goes on. And how much is enough, if you like? And how do you, how do you balance that need? It's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult, Mark, because I remember I did a – you reminded me i um before i met you actually back in the late 90s uh late late 80s i did a piece of research with rover cars as it was then and i went in to look at their data and where they got it from and i coined the phrase i've been writing called data blindness (laughs) they couldn't see through the data they had so much data they couldn't actually work out what the hell it meant because you could cut it and chop it and display it in so many different ways they actually created a war room and the idea was that they display all their kpis in this war room and then the managers could come in and in the morning they could look around the war room and see where the issues were within the business they soon realized that they couldn't work out what it is and what it needed was somebody to take a view of what were the important performance indicators and more importantly the key performance indicators in terms of how they wanted to run their business And it seemed like nobody wanted to do that. They felt that they didn't, it's a bit like marketing, they wanted to do it all, where actually by focusing on a particular area and doing that really well, they'd get an insight. The only way I think nowadays, Mark, is if people don't understand is to start off with an idea of what it is and then do agile on it and fail fast, isn't it? Just build something, see if it works, and then if it doesn't, try something else. Um, And I think the, 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 I guess the ability to manipulate data in ways that you can use is far easier these days than it was 25 years ago. Uh, integrating a systems is far easier because of you know all the APIs and stuff that can be set up. Um, but uh, fundamentally, it needs to be the leaders of that organization who make those decisions because they're the ones who hopefully are using that information to make decisions for the business. Um, Perhaps it's a bit like the user journeys, Marks. Perhaps those managers need training in to understand how to develop or how to look for key, per, you know, key performance indicators. What one what does one look like? Um, I'm fact, I'm writing a guide at the moment from one, one of my clients on this very topic in terms of, you know, if you're running a big organisation, what are the things you need to focus? What are the what are the ten things, for example, you need in order to have a good enough view of your business? let's say the 80-20 rule applies, that you've got a good understanding of how your business is and you're picking up on the things that are critical to your business. Um, but I don't think that's something a, a user or a lower manager can do because 
they can have an opinion and they could help build it but i'm not sure that they they have the authority or the responsibility to do that i think that's really that's an important part of running a business and i think that comes to building a data culture within um the organization as well and you can you can do that start small and expand out just like well okay well we're analyzing this look we can make some improvements here perhaps yeah. it's not perhaps it's not value necessary perhaps it's reducing costs if we if we if we do something slightly different yeah we can save a lot of money off 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 off, off our cost which is ultimately going to improve the value that we're, we're going to deliver it is difficult though i, I do agree it's, it's you know because it's some of these things they're not cheap but you can start small and as you said fail yeah. early so and i think one ironically one of the things that has helped is gdpr mm. because what gdpr has done is it's forced people to look at the data and how they store it and what they keep and they've realized that if they're going to invest they should look at it as an asset rather than just a load of data around the place and yeah, gdpr has forced companies to do that so I think, you know, I think that has been, you know, while it's a pain for many companies and has stopped certain activities that you may are saying on the edge, overall, I think it's a benefit because it will force people to take data seriously, whereas before, sort of more was best, wasn't it? You know, that the, was uh, I, won't, I won't mention who, uh, but I work with a company, um, FTSE 100 company, financial services company, probably about, I guess it was about two years ago now. Um, and uh, what was in, so encouraging to see is that they had they'd established a proper uh, data governance and data ownership um, group, um, and were very focused on data quality and you know and so on. And I'm, I'm no doubt now they're, they're focused on getting the value from from that that they yeah. put the basics in place. Um, uh, so I was really really encouraged by, you know, by, by that um, because it was um, run by the business. What concerns me is that data is perceived as a technical word. word and it gets shoved into IT or whatever IT happens to be called within within that organisation, um, and like everything else we've been talking about today, um, you know, you, you don't have that business lens uh, to know when enough is enough, or when you've got it, when you know when you need to when you need a bit more, and you and the IT people, you know, they'll keep on doing what they're asked to do. They'll keep on gathering more and more and more more data, and, and not sit back for it, and 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 necessarily say uh, as you know, look at what it's actually telling them. I think you're right. And and I think it's a different set of skills, Mark, to be mm. honest, because you need to have a better understanding of the business. Because, you know, building a database and sticking data in, does anybody care whether the data, as long as the data is accurate in the sense that it doesn't change if you move it from one system to another or something happens to it in, in between? Mm. You know, most of the IT guys will say, fine, that's my job done. Uh, whereas the business person would be looking at it and say, well, what does that mean? You know, how yeah, can I yeah. use that information? And I think that's what I was, we talked about earlier is about the two different languages. And I think the more and more that you can bring those two tribes together to work more closely and not have this situation, as you say, where you know a decision is made to move uh, to have an IT system, <coughs> and then it suddenly goes to the IT department, see you in six months. <coughs> I think the more that that um, more that we can overcome that type of model, I think. Um, more successful IT systems development will be. Okay. I think we just need to find a way through this video conferencing thing of, of me giving you a glass of water here, David. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go and get one, David, take a break. Yeah, if you need to take yeah, you know, five or ten seconds to do because we can we can waffle on for hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you need a drink? I think I'm all right now. Good. Sure? <laughs> all right. Well, I, I guess that take that takes us to our favourite time of the show. Where we uh, we we ask the 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 sort of the the fun questions, and I don't know whose turn it is, Mark, because I've, 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 I've lost the plot completely as usual. Well, I, 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 I'll ask the first one, then you ask the okay. second. There's two questions here, David, right? And they, yep. they're meant to be a bit of fun. But I got asked this question myself um, on on a podcast I was on earlier this week. Not obviously not this one, and I stumbled over the answer because I've been asking this question for months now, and I'd never actually thought my own answer. And the answer I gave you was horrendous. Um, no pressure, well, it, felt, it, felt horrendous. Better, yeah. it felt horrendous when I, when I when I was given it. I think it was all right, but um, I, I, I then give it some thought and I thought, oh, that's a better answer. And then I'll, I'll share my answer with you after if you want it anyway, what, what, sure. what my answer should be. So the answer is, what advice would you give your younger self? All right, starting out on your career, was there any, was there any advice you'd give yourself knowing what you know now? Yes, I think I would say... Um, Work more in sales, 
I have done some selling, but I think exposure at the the uh, the sharp end is really important in terms of helping you understand that. Yeah, and don't be afraid to um, move industry because although I have done it, I've done it three times in effect. But in the early days, I felt that as I was trained in a, as an engineer, I ought to do an engineering career. Mm-hmm. And that was my future. And it was only after about five or six years I realized that actually far more opportunities were open to me. Now, I think that probably is a sign of the business world in the 80s. The opportunities weren't there. I think today that's probably maybe even the exact opposite of that. And there are so many opportunities for do for doing that. But looking back, that, that did hold me back because <clears throat> I went to, I was seconded to America when I was 23 and I, fe- I, I got involved with CAD CAM in its very, very early days. And I came back and I thought I'd like to do that. And I ne- I, it took me four or five years to get into the IT industry. And I had to do that by going off to do an MBA to give myself the authority to be able to go to IT and say, look, I've got a bit behind me. I know a bit about this stuff. Mm. So that would probably be what I say is don't close down your options too early. Mm. And if you see an opportunity, go with your heart rather than this through your head. Because I think what we all find is when we get, if you like, near to the end of our careers is that we'd like to look back and think that everything we did was enjoyable now, yeah. you know, and, and that's the important thing to me. And I can generally say that most of the time there are a couple of significant exceptions and, You'll be glad to know, Mark, that wasn't working with you wasn't one of those. Um, <laughs> I was waiting there for that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I generally look back and think that uh, I've enjoyed it. And the fact that I've worked in engineering in the IT industry and then most recently in uh, uh, driver and automate- automotive stuff is has been good. And I'm glad I've had that opportunity. So that's what I'd say to somebody. Cool. Somebody said uh, something. I can't remember it was on this on on one of these earlier shows or, or whether it was something else I uh, read. It might have been. Oh, I think it was actually. I think it was Simon Jones earlier on. Earlier on, he said um, was, Simon's a good mate of mine. He's a tennis uh, tennis coach, and now he's moved into the world um, of, of of football. Um, he said, "Not uh, it was something like um, you can't always um, work on um, things that you enjoy." but you can find enjoyment in what you do. And yes. I thought that's a really quite insightful, you know, uh, point there. So I wasn't trying to pick apart what you were saying there, but I think... No, no, yeah. I think I think the reality is it's probably a bit of both, Mark, yeah. to be honest. It, there are people, and you hear it always from the entertainment industry, is that I've got a job and uh, it's not really a job and I do this for nothing. And then you know there are lots of people in this country who are working at jobs that they find really hard, you know, packaging or delivery i don't know but you know things that they wouldn't necessarily choose to do and i think um you know i would i would ask anybody and my son's at the age where he's coming out with a degree and i'm trying to say to him rather than necessarily being myopic in terms of what you can do based on your skills try and think more broadly than that because you know you might find that doesn't work for you or you prefer to work in a different way so keep those options open whereas i didn't think that i just mm-hmm. felt you know, I've got an engineering degree. How do I use that? Rather yeah. than thinking, right, I've got a skill set. How do I use that? I guess. Yeah, and I think you know, people, people still buy from people. Um, you know, in, in in today's world, I think that's that's as true today as it was. You know, thirty or thirty odd years ago, and um, probably sixty odd years ago. You know, be- well well before our time. I'm going to add there on that. Um, uh, and. Um, Everybody will tell you, and in the IT, specifically in the IT industry, we did. Uh, Gethin and I did something with with my youngest uh, lad who works for Hayes um, now. Um, and even in the IT industry, there, you know, pe- people would say, "Yeah, okay, fine. When you really know whether you've got the Microsoft this, that, and the other certification, but actually, can I get on with you? Can you know? Can I can yeah. I work with you? And are you going to you know uh, uh, think more laterally and communicate with me? All those sort of." transferable type skills can you organize yourself you know uh, 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 at least if not more important than the actual explicit um qualification if you like that, that, well, that you've got i think it's very true I've, I've in recent times i've worked and talked to a few people in the bus industry interestingly enough and they don't recruit bus drivers 
they recruit people who have gus good customer engagement skills and then they train them to be a bus driver well that's definitely changed in the last 30 so, years <laughs> yeah but it's it's that type of view which is okay what what you what are you know so I don't know if you remember, well, I remember going buses in the 70s and 80s and they wouldn't even stop if you were five yards away from the thing. It was like, well, you, you're you're the naughty boy, not me, the bus driver. And I think that's completely changed because there's been this view that who you creep first is people that you can engage with and get on with. And then the skills may come second. And I think, you know, as the market for, you know, quality people seems to be tightening, I think that will become uh, more and more important. Do you think that's got something to do with a shift in in sort of work patterns, or like just the bus driver example you said, in 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 the seventies? I wasn't around then, so I can't possibly comment on what buses were like. That I don't even know if they were nationalised then or not, right? But at some point, there may have been a national bus service. I can't remember. I might be. I might have that. I might have that completely wrong. But where, with my joke there, what, what what I'm trying to get at is um, there has been a shift in how people work, and you alluded to it in what you in what in what yeah. you were saying then and the, and the sort of functional boundaries have come down so whereas now like a bus driver in the 70s uh, if you drive the bus for eight hours you will get this and this is the set of rules and you follow yeah. these rules and this is what you do people think a little bit more uh, uh wider than the, the, their job now and they want to get more satisfaction and more internal gratification yeah. for doing for doing work so stopping for someone who's missed the bus is a nice thing to do whereas they might have got told off <coughs> that in the 70s whereas now it's like well hang on, yeah. this, this old you, know, you think about people who use buses now compared to then because that's probably changed a little bit as well the old yeah. dear who's, who's, who's not on the bus stop it's like well i'll stop and let you on sorry i don't mean to be well it's anyone to say old dear but um, no no but i think i think it's important and i think there's two things that have happened that very briefly is one the um the regulatory authorities have got involved and for example i believe it's transport for london they actually publish customer uh, satisfaction um results for each of the bus companies in london based on mystery shopping mm. and the reason i know that is some of our company used to be mystery shoppers oh, so right. they used to jump on a bus at a particular stop they'd watch as the as the journey progressed and if there was harsh braking or um you know they they shot off when a, a lady was trying to sit down before she sat down and all those things those would all be logged and fed back and they would get a lower score so there was right. then and basically when you're when in a competitive situation in london for bus contracts and you come back and your customer satisfaction score is lower than your competition guess who they're going to go with so that there has it's it was a bit of a top on that particular case it was a bit of a top down thing which yeah. is we need to transform our industry but it has then transformed the way that they recruit yeah so yeah. who knows you know the the, the pandemic might uh, create a new situation where things change i don't know but uh yeah, you're, you're quite right. We, we've got to we've got to close off. So I'll, I'll ask the the, the the next question in a roundabout, or the last question in a roundabout way, if um, if if, if, I, if I may, Geth, because we were Go just talking me. there about um, we were actually talking there about what people measure, um, and I know in contact centres, for example, just to give you another example, they, 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 lots of people are now, thank God, stop measuring. You know how many, you know, how long it takes to answer a call, which of course is important, but yeah. what's really important is the service that you're offering during that. You know, and and and, and uh, uh, just to you know. Little segue, um, you know, the people need to be measuring the value that they're providing, not, yep. not the price or the, or the cost of it. Anyway, right. So to close the show off, David, tell us a fun fact about yourself that um, that maybe not not that many people know. OK, um, I was a child interviewer on Radio 4. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. What, what, what does that mean, um, David? Um, you interviewed children I, or you were... I, I took pass and I, I well and also I'm in the Radio Times. How's that? Um, so in 1972, I attended a drama class at my local drama school, and one day I got plucked out of that and um, asked to go and record some of my voice into this machine. And a couple of weeks after that, I was told that I'd been chosen with a, a another another person a little girl called beverly who i think was about 12 or 11 to go to three events and interview people at those events oh, so fantastic. i went i went to a stately home uh i went to an air display and i actually went down to slimbridge and interviewed peter scott okay. the uh wild fowl um and bird um 
he was very famous in the 70s and 80s yeah. in terms of conservation and you know he was doing that um so yeah and then that got um that was recorded and then i was put out on this program called fourth dimension that came out on a saturday i only did it three times but yeah it was um and i got photographs of me in shorts and i had a very very high voice as well it probably, uh, and somewhere um, i have the recording but it probably um, <laughs> competed with tiswell so I, I can't say that i ever saw that david you know because that tiswell was more, <laughs> more, more my um my, my, my level of, of highbrowness uh, you know on that but maybe talking about transferable skills um we'll, we'll let clip get in closing now but maybe <laughs> you should be doing a stephen fry and 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 uh, using your voice to generate to to to, to, to um to sell for people's uh, uh, Kindle books and so on when they want it, when they want, it, when they want it, an audio version of that. Well, do you know, I've tried to do that on, vid you know, going to a studio and try to do video stuff, and it's the hardest thing on earth, Mark. It's just, <laughs> it's really, really difficult. Perhaps, you know, I'm much, mu much better on the sort of free form rather than speaking to a script. But um, no, that's my, if I can find it, I'll send you the um, my Radio Times entry. <laughs> please please do send that to us david please do um I, I, on that note though i do think that brings us to the end of the show everybody um ladies and gentlemen we've been talking to uh david richards of talk about value david thank you for coming on it's been a very enjoyable uh very enjoyable chat thanks dave well thanks for inviting me and uh good luck to you with your um your podcast thank you